Okay, so I don't see anybody else pulling in uh, parking lot. I think we've got everybody inside that was out there. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And, and Dan, if you could, if people just come in, just remind them to grab uh, the sheets if they come in a little bit later. Let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you did to us, in us, through us, in the waters of holy baptism, for connecting us to Jesus, to his life that he lived in, his place, in our place, to his death that he died in our place, and to his resurrection that certainly gives us life in heaven one day, but life already now. Help us grow in our faith, in our understanding, and in our knowledge of all of those things in our study this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it seems like it's been a month since we, well, it has been, it's been a month uh, since we met. So we've gotten through the, the Apostles' Creed, the first three articles and their meanings, and we're going to continue now today and next week with the two sacraments. We'll have a little bit of review in certain sections of this outline that we already covered primarily in the third article, a little bit in the second. But just by way of there are four parts to baptism. We're just going to look at the first part initially, the institution of baptism. What is baptism? This is on your cover sheet. You have all four uh, meanings listed there. Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water used by God's command and connected with God's word, um, which is that word of God. Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a closer look. We had this in the third article. It's a key term. It's a sacrament. We are operating with a very Lutheran definition of a sacrament. Other denominations have other definitions for a sacrament, and that's okay. Scripture doesn't necessarily define what a sacrament is. However, it does define what certain things do. Based on this sacrament, we'll see that there are two sacraments, according to this de definition in, in Scripture. We have this again. It's a sacred act that was instituted by God. God came up with this. God started this, um, commanded by God. God said to do this, to keep doing this to his church, uh, something he gave to his church. It's a means of grace, a sacrament. It's part of gospel, so it's connected to God's word. This is what the Holy Spirit will be working through. But what makes a sacrament a different means of grace than just the gospel that's spoken or read or studied or shared or memorized or preached is that it has this earthly element, something you can see, something you can touch, something you can taste, something you can feel, something tangible. Um, and then, most importantly, then since a means of grace, this is going to be something that offers the forgiveness of sin. So as we look at baptism today, we'll see that it's going to check each one of those boxes. Spoiler alert. Interestingly enough, kind of a sidebar, maybe I've mentioned this in the past, but it's at the lesson in baptism, it's at the lesson in the, in the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. This is where, over the years, I've seen it's not the roles of men and women, it's, it's not um, voting in the church, it's not closed communion, it's not fellowship. Those aren't the things that tend to turn people off who are going through a Bible information class in one of our Wells churches, it's actually the sacraments, which is um, quite interesting. Maybe we can consider as we go through this lesson why, why that would be. But the word baptize, the word baptizo in the Greek, I baptize, um, in Mark chapter 7, you have your sheets there, but you talk about the Pharisees, the religious leaders, just um, the Jews in general were using that term baptizo to wash a ton of different things in that passage in Mark 7, like cups, plates, kettles, pitchers, dishes. Uh, there's even a, a, a translation or, or a manuscript that even talks about them washing couches and sofas, baptizing. Here, the point is the word baptize was already in the Greek. It was already in the Aramaic languages, and it simply meant to apply water for the purpose of washing. So the young Jesus would come to the dinner table and mom, mother, Mary would say, Jesus, did you baptizo your hands? Did you wash your hands, Jesus, before you sat down? After he would use the outhouse or the restroom, Jesus would come back inside. Mary would say, Jesus, did you baptizo your hands? Did you wash your hands? So the word was already in play. The word was already in use. It's not until Jesus in the Great Commission says, now baptizo, apply water, wash, now as you share the word of God, specifically as you baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now we have not just baptizo, but baptism. We have a sacrament, a sacred act instituted by God, 
Jesus, and commanded by Christ, Jesus, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, in which water is applied any amount. You think about them washing a cup or a kettle or a sofa. They might be dunking it in the water. They might be splashing the water. Today we would think about spraying down with the power washer the deck, maybe running the car through the car wash. They probably weren't picking up those sofas and taking them down to the Jordan River. That probably one wouldn't get their sofa any cleaner. <laughs> probably make it worse and stink. But the point is they weren't submersing all these things that they were baptizoing. The point is when we apply water, it doesn't say how much or how, but that we use the word of God for the forgiveness of sins. All right, let's take a closer look. What are we using? What does Jesus command us to use? Ephesians 5, um, he's, uh, sorry, wrong passage. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. How? Cleansing her with washing through water, through the word to make her holy. What do we have? We've got the water, any amount, and we've got the word. Um, this isn't on your sheet, but that Trinitarian formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We'll use the words that Jesus has given to us, the words that Jesus has given to his church, and we'll repeat those whenever we baptize someone. To baptize all nations, go and make disciples of all nations. Acts chapter 2, um, Peter is preaching there. It's the day of Pentecost, and he's talking about the promise, the promise of salvation, the promise of forgiveness, the promise of the Spirit, the promise of washing sins away. And he says, this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So we baptize all nations, which is going to include adults, but it's also going to include children. Um, the Lutheran Church isn't the only church that baptizes infants or babies. Obviously, Catholics do. Um, those who aren't baptizing infants are already toying with the doctrine of original sin. They're already toying with what a sacrament is. This is where we tend to lose a lot of them because they turn, want to turn um, the human nature, the human ego, the human understanding wants to turn a sacrament into something we do for God rather than something that God does for us. Um, it's a means of grace through which God washes away our sins. Certainly there's an element, certainly with an adult, to come and say, I'm already a believer in Christ. I have not been baptized. I want to be baptized to confess my grace, faith in Christ, to make this a public profession. There's certainly an element to that um, with the adults, but, but primarily baptism is what God's doing for us. But we in the Lutheran Church baptize children for three reasons. And the first one, admittedly, isn't the strongest argument. An argument from silence is never the best reason to do anything. But in Matthew 28, Jesus says, baptize all nations. In Acts 2, Jesus said, your promise, the promise for you and your children. So we'd say they're part of all nations. Again, an argument from silence, but we have no prohibition. We have no negative command in Scripture to ever say, baptize all nations, but not until they're eight. Baptize all nations, everyone over 12. Baptize all nations, but whatever you do, don't take an infant and apply water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It will, it will damn them for eternity. There's nothing like that in the Bible that would prohibit us from doing it or to say it's dangerous or wrong or sinful. Again, an argument from silence. But an argument nonetheless. They're part of all nations. Better, Psalm 51, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived. John chapter 3, that, that awesome dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus. Jesus and Nicodemus talking about entering the kingdom of God. We must be born again. And Jesus says why we have to be born again. He says because flesh gives birth to, to flesh. What's the point there? Jesus is talking about, David is talking about original sin. Why do we baptize babies? Because they need it. Because they are sinful. So those who aren't baptizing babies are saying... Baptize, we don't baptize babies because they don't need it. They're not sinful. They're born neutral. That whole original sin thing. They're neither good nor, nor bad, or they're just good. That's contrary to Scripture. So baptism is a means of grace that God has given to his church for, exactly for those little ones, um, so that the Holy Spirit can work in their, in their hearts. Again, it's a matter of faith, always a matter of the heart not a matter of the head. It's, it's not what we know and understand and can say. It, it's what's planted there. It's what's given there. It's what's received. It's what God does um, in our hearts. And that's what God does for those babies. 
Morning, guys. There's sheets on the... Oh, you've got them. You've been through this. Roy. All right, Matthew 18, Mark 10. Two cases where Jesus is talking about two markedly different age groups in Matthew 18. Um, the micron, the micros, the, the littler ones. And then Mark 10, um, the paideia, the techna, the little ones, the toddlers. Um, what's Jesus saying about each of them? If anyone who co- would cause one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them if they had a millstone hung around their neck, drawn in the depths of the sea. What does Jesus say about these little ones, these children? He says they're able to believe. In fact, so much so are they able to believe that what does Jesus use the little children for? For you and for me. As an example of faith. What, what does he call faith? Childlike faith. Because it's simple trust. It peels through all the reason, all the logic, all the what if, all the caveats, all the quid pro quo, everything that's going to have to make sense before I can accept it. Everything that's going to have to make sense before I'll ever believe it. Unless I see, unless I put, Thomas, I will not believe it. No, childlike faith. Right? JP's, maybe he's not too old. Yeah, he's too old. But when he was younger, middle of winter, Age three or four, you know, a guy who loves to go to the beach, a guy who loves to swim, a guy who loves to go tubing behind the boat. Hey, JP, put your, put your swimming suit on. We're going to hook up the boat. We're heading up to Fremont Lakes. We're going to go tubing. He doesn't take into account that it's 28 degrees outside. He doesn't take into account that the boat's in storage. He doesn't take into account that the lake is frozen over. Dad said we're going tubing. Of course we're going to go tubing. That's childlike faith. He just trusts. I don't want to say blindly, but faithfully trusts. That's the faith God would call us to have. That's the faith the Holy Spirit gives us in baptism, to simply believe. And believe what? These three things about infant baptism, since they're scriptural. Um, Moving on to the blessings of baptism. Let's read this together. The blessings of baptism, second. Here we go. What does baptism do for us? Ready? Baptism works for forgiveness of sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. What is God's promise? Christ, our Lord, says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So what are these blessings? Um, Acts 2, um, Peter already said, get up and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 22, a great picture of baptism. Someone want to take that? Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, it's passage 10 on our sheet. Go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, there's, thank you. There's a ton of pictures in the Bible for forgiveness. Justification to declare not guilty. Redemption to be bought back. Um, here, what is it? The filth, the dirt, the mud, the muck of sin and guilt. Sins that we commit, thought, word, and deed, but also the sinful nature. And what does baptism do? It's a beautiful picture. Remember something tangible, something we can see here? Water. Washing. The baby's not going to, baby probably looks beautiful and clean and smells great and has a beautiful white dress or suit on already. So outwardly, the baby looks great. Well, how would you ever wash that? It's, it's the spiritual water. It's the washing away uh, of sin. It's like the old blackboard with the chalk and how dusty those were. You know, the teacher really didn't erase anything. He just you know, spread the, the chalk dust all over the, the blackboard, and then it kind of looked like a gray board. And it wasn't until Friday, right, if that was your job, one, go pound out the erasers, and then two, get a damp cloth. Oh, that looked good. I suppose it was still black. So today, if anyone wants to, the whiteboards down in the fellowship hall could use a good cleaning with the Expo spray and the, and the dust to just take away all that. So you can't even see a smudge. You can't even see a previous mark. You can't even tell what word was written there like you kind of can now. That's what it is at baptism. God washes that all away. He buries our sin in the depths of the sea. He separates all of that from us as far as east is from west. The forgiveness of sins. Um, Mark 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Where there's forgiveness, there's eternal salvation. They're great comfort. These are great passages. Ephesians 2, passage 12. Someone want to take that? Ephesians 2. Someone want to take that? Rachel, do you have it? Was that a hand? No, you got it now. All right. Uh, number 12, please. Yeah. 
two great pictures of what, remember we were on the outside looking in, we were enemies, we were hostile, dead in transgressions and sin, we hated God. And what pictures does Paul use in Ephesians? Fellow citizens, citizenship, um, members of God's household, members of his family. Um, I'm a child of God. Think about what great comfort, we're, again, C, period, great comfort, one, period, I'm a child of God. Think about what that would mean for a teenager who's wrestling with some guilt, who's wrestling with, we're going to talk a little bit about bullying in the sermon, who's wrestling with uh, maybe identity, who's, who's wrestling with decisions. Who's, think, of, think about a uh, 20, 30-something-year-old troubles in the marriage, maybe feels she's uh, maybe an empty nester. Uh, I was a bad parent. You, know, you think about all the bad things you did and never remember um, what God was able to do through, through you as a parent. And whatever it is going through in life, maybe it's just that guilt, but to say at the end of the day or throughout the day, I'm a child of God, washed, robed, redeemed in Christ. I'm a member of his family. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing will ever separate me from his, his love. To say, God adopted me. God watches over me. Um, I'm a child of God. Um, Titus 3, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Um, the end of the passage goes on being heirs of eternal life. It's, it seems like it was the last few weeks in worship, regardless of who was preaching, it seemed like uh, life is tough, but heaven's coming. I, I pray that never becomes cliche. You know, Moses in Psalm 90, 70 or 80 years, if we have uh, the strength to get through this life. Uh, there's a lot of life to live, and there's a, lot of, there's a little bit of that in the sermon today to say, take the bad and, and use it. God, good, help, help me change my perspective, my outlook toward, toward life. But um, to say, I am an heir of eternal life, come what may, I know that this is, temp heaven is my home. I'm just a stranger here. The list could go on is to say, this isn't our be all and end all. This isn't the end game. This isn't the final destination. Maybe in our sin, we, sinful nature, we get too connected to this world, whether it's the good things or, or the bad things that cause frustration or that bring us joy and comfort is to say, ah, Keep our eyes fixed on Christ, on things above, not on things below. Where your treasure is, there your heart. And you see how it just goes, Scripture just goes on and on and on to say, heir of eternal life. Um, Galatians 3, um, it ties back to number one. You're all sons, you're all daughters, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with, with Christ. Um, if anybody knows, I could not remember the name of it. I, I should, and I, I, I just thought of it now. But a country singer, what, Rose Colored Glasses. Anyone know who sang that? Who was it? No, it's a guy. Sorry. Uh, I can picture him. No, not Charlie Pry. Sorry. Let's, we're not leaving until we get it. Someone Google it. Rose, I can't. Was it? Not George Strait. George Jones? Nope, that's a good guess, though. Is it really? I, I am so sorry to everybody wasting your time. This is going to be a terrible illustration that we're spending 20 minutes thinking of the guy. What's the point of rose-colored glasses? What do they say about love? Love is blind. You don't necessarily see everything. You see things from one perspective. Who is it? The same guy who's saying... Uh, Okay, all right, good. I didn't think it was him either, but that's good. What's the point? God looks at us not through rose-colored glasses, but Christ-colored glasses. Think about what that means. When God the Father looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see the sins we commit. He doesn't hear the sins we, we say, he, he, the things we don't say. He's not offended by those things. He's, he doesn't even see our sinful nature, our old Adam. When he looks at us in Christ, he sees only his perfection, only his righteousness, only his obedience. His, his innocence covers our guilt. Um, common man was the other one. 
that he sang, isn't it? I'm just a common man, drive a common man. That's why I didn't think it was him, but we'll move on. I'm clothed with Christ, great comfort. The power of baptism, how can water do such great things? What do you tell me? A little bit of water is going to do all that stuff? Well, Luther would say, let's read it together. It is certainly not the water that does such things, but God's word, which is in and with the water, and faith, which trusts this word used with the water. For without God's word, the water is just plain water and not baptism. But with this word of God, it is baptism. God's word makes it a washing through which God graciously forgives our sin and grants us rebirth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Um, Where is this written? Let's read this. This is an awesome section. Um, Titus 3, ready? God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Uh, The power of baptism, we just read Titus 3, it's the Holy Spirit, the faith maker, the faith creator, the sanctifier, the faith strengthener. He's the one working through the gospel. He's the one working through the means of grace, whether that's word or whether that's sacrament, whether that's baptism or Lord's Supper. We would have a baptism here. You'd see Pastor Kester. You'd see Mom. You'd maybe see Dad. You'd see the baby. Maybe you'd see a sponsor, a godparent, a witness. You're going to hear Pastor talking. You're going to see the water splashing. Maybe baby cries. Maybe baby coos. You're going to see a lot going on. But none of them are the ones doing anything. It's the person you don't see um, that's working through that word. It's the Holy Spirit working um, through the word of God that's connected to that water. Father, Son, Holy Spirit as it's applied. Colossians 2 is not talking about baptism, but let's read it here. What does that word have the power to do? Um, Passage 16. Sharon? Okay, not the passage I was thinking of. Clearly it is talking about baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Um, that's got to be the wrong passage there. I apologize. I'll have to look that up. But baptism, the Holy Spirit is creating faith. Um, what does faith do? Faith has the power to trust God's promises. Childlike faith. We're going tubing even though it's the middle of the winter. Okay. And then faith often referred to as the hand that receives. It's through that faith that we receive all of these blessings, the the gifts of the Spirit, peace, hope, patience, gentleness, um, self-control, the list goes on. Um, The forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, eternal life. It's through that faith. So again, think about, we said faith is a matter of the heart, not a matter of the head. The head thinks about, the the head rationalizes, the head reasons, the, the head is logical, the head maps this out, and there's a place for all of that in reading and studying, but it's, but it, faith is a matter of the heart, where the Holy Spirit is working to place something there then that's going to receive blessing after blessing. Sharon. The question was, does faith often come across as, what was your word again? A stumbling. a stumbling block to other people. And I would say absolutely, because it's countercultural. Faith, um, simply receiving, simply believing, not having to do anything, not having to earn anything, not having to be anything, not able to contribute to anything, not be what you can be, be all you are, um, you deserve this, you work for this. That's culture, that's society, that's our own um, nature. We have this opinion of the law that says I can do something to get right with God. I need to do something to get right with God. And it's that doctrine of original sin that says, no, you can't. And so it is, it, it is totally countercultural, totally a stumbling block, because we have to, if, if you want to say we have to do something, we can't even do this, but we have to check our pride at the door. We have to humble ourselves before, before God. A classic example of that would be the Pharisee and the the tax collector in the temple, both of them praying, the one up, you know, out in front, and I thank you, God, that I'm not like the rest of the... Well, that's pride. We'll talk about that in the sermon. But it's the tax collector off in the corner, off in the distance, 
full of contrition, full of repentance, full of faith, beating his breast and just saying, God, have mercy on me, um, a sinner. So that's one of those things, though, as much as it's a stumbling block and as much as we need to check pride at the door and as much as we can outline the passages that deal with original sin, there, too, we, we need the Holy Spirit working through that word because that's only going to be something that the Holy Spirit can change in someone's heart, attitude, perspective, those who are at first service. We'll hear that again. Um, great point, though. The people of baptism, if you just take a look at your outline, this page, next page, um, please note the number of passages on the left side. Yeah, there's none. So we're going to talk about the people of baptism here a little bit. We'll talk about some things that aren't commanded in Scripture, um, required uh, by God, but things that have been in place, things that can be a good tradition, a good custom, things that can be perhaps misunderstood or misused. But if we talk about God, parents and sponsors, um, parents of a child who's going to be baptized may ask someone to be the sponsor or godparent of their child. Some of the things that parents are asking the sponsor to do would include, again, no passages for you here. This is just kind of tradition. This is just kind of practicality. This is just kind of kept in obvious stuff. But be concerned about the spiritual welfare of the child. Hey, this is an important thing for us as parents to say we want to raise this child in the training and admonition of the Lord. We see the Holy Spirit planting a seed in our child's heart, the seed of faith, and we want that faith to be fed and nurtured, and we want that child to grow in that faith and to grow ever closer to Jesus and to remain faithful to the point of death so that he or she can receive this crown. And we know this is hard. We know that there's temptation. We know that there's distraction. We know there's a lot of things tugging and pulling, and so we want help. So we're going to recruit someone we know, someone we trust, someone who's got priorities straight, someone who will get to this but believes and confesses what we believe and confess to help us in this, to hold us accountable and to take an active interest in this child's relationship with Jesus. Not just when they're kids. That's easy enough. Maybe when they're teenagers. Maybe when they're 20-somethings. Maybe when they're 42 Remind the child of his or her baptism and what it means. Talk to them. Intentionalize the conversation about baptism that you are a child of God. Remind them that your sin has been washed away. Remind them that they're robed in Christ. This could be something of great comfort to them when they're wrestling with guilt, when they're wrestling with identity, when they're wrestling with meaning and purpose in life. You can be there as a sponsor, as a godparent, to remind them of what God did for them in baptism. Right alongside that would be assure them. Maybe they're wrestling with some sin. Maybe they're wrestling with some temptation. Maybe there's extreme guilt over something they did five years ago or yesterday. God washed all that sin away. I was there. I was holding you. The water was applied in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit worked in your heart. Um, and we're going to look at it in a little bit. But baptism connected you to Jesus, to his life, to his death, to his resurrection. Great comfort. It's, it's just another way to share the gospel. Um, pray for the child. And if you're going to pray for the child, what might be some things you're going to pray for your God child? That they'd continue to come to church, that they'd continue to feed their faith, that they continue to study the scriptures, that they continue to read the word, that they continue to grow, that they continue to serve, that they might find a God-fearing spouse someday, they might raise their children, they might become active in service. The, the list would go on and on. No, it wasn't necessarily that they'd be successful in life when necessarily that they'd pass. I guess it wasn't necessarily that they'd find a good college. Maybe to that point, too, we haven't gotten through all of them, but so far we haven't gotten, when you pick your godparents for your children, we haven't gotten to those who are going to give the best presents. <laughs> those who have the ability to give great toys or cool clothes. Um, those aren't the kind of sponsors we're necessarily looking for here. Um, Encourage the child to read and study God's word. Ask them. Maybe, maybe you're privileged to be at the same congregation where your God child goes to church in Sunday school. After Sunday school, ask him, ask her, hey, what was Sunday class about today? Maybe Sunday afternoon you get a chance to call because they go to church 400 miles away. Hey, how was church today? We talked about this. What did you talk about? That's taking this whole responsibility as a sponsor seriously, isn't it? Maybe not just on the birthday. Maybe not just on the baptism anniversary. Maybe not just coming to confirmation class. 
You know, your child is starting confirmation class. Your godchild is starting confirmation class. Maybe occasionally you can call and say, hey, what was your lesson about today? Those are great opportunities to stay involved in, and connected. Um, there's no legal... There's no legal rights of godparents, and I think we probably all understand this. Maybe that wasn't the understanding a generation ago. Maybe it was. But it was always a reminder, too. But um, if you as a parent want someone to have legal custody of your child, should, God forbid, something happen to you and God call you home early, you've got to get that um, communicated legally in some way. You've got to let that be known. It's not just an assumption that your child would be raised by the, the godparents or that your godparents would be willing to do that. That's not what you ask them to do, if you think about it. If you want them to do that, too, then ask them that and then get that in your will or in a document or whatever. But I, I think better than that, look after the spiritual well-being of the child, especially if the parents should die. What's more likely, die or change their attitude toward God and his word? Maybe sometimes as the godparent you have to say, hey, my godchild wasn't in church today. Last I checked, he doesn't have a license yet. He's eight. Hold them accountable. That's what they asked you to do, whether they realize it or not. But, so, not commanded anywhere in Scripture, but helpful, good, especially if it came out of what, where would a custom like this come, come from? Persecution of Christians. Persecution of the church to say, hey, if I don't come back from the market and I'm thrown into the arena, uh, make sure my children are raised to know Jesus. Practicality, right? How about today? Persecution, persecution of Christian, temptation, maybe not physical, you think about what our young people are exposed to today. You think mom and dad don't want some support in teaching them right from wrong? Morals? The gospel? Absolutely. Uh, point, uh, in light of everything that parents are asking sponsors to do for their child, it's only natural and wise that people whom the parents ask to serve as sponsors for their child would be same public confession as they are. This is where that whole fellowship thing comes in, but it, it's a good reason. Who, who, who am I going to ask? Let me give an illustration. I'll try to be quick. I don't want to take too much time with this, but um, let's just suppose as a Packer fan, boo hits, whatever you want to do. Let's just suppose as a Packer fan, I want my children to be raised Packer fans. I want them to watch the games on Sunday. I want them to know the history of the Green Bay Packers. I want them to uh, check in online or Green Bay Press Gazette and stay, stay current. I, I want them to know the players, the roster. I want them to show their, their pride in the Green Bay Packers. I want them to wear some gear. I want them to have some reminders in their rooms with posters and, and pennants and, and banners and, and all of this stuff. I'm not going to ask Mr. Peterson <laughs> to be the football sponsors of my children. Mr. Peterson, our principal, is a Vikings fan. Why would, I, why would I do that? He knows a lot about football. He knows a lot about the rules. He knows a lot about the history of the NFL. He, he knows a lot about the Packers. He knows the roster. He knows some of that history and tradition. But if I should change my opinion toward the Packers, or if I should no longer be on the face of the, this earth, I have no guarantee that he's not going to tune on the wrong, tune in the wrong channel on Sunday afternoon and bring my kids over and expose them to the purple and the goal. That would be terrible. Get them a... Get them a, rather than the Green Bay Press Gazette, all of a sudden they're reading the St. Paul Times. You know, now the next thing they know, they're showing up in a, you know, in a, in a, I don't even know anyone on the Vikings, so I can't tell you whose jersey they're wearing, but I would be terrible, right? Have one of my brothers come to the house, and there's, there they've got a, a, a pennant of the Minnesota Vikings. Fran Tarkenton, that goes way back. That's silly, right? We're not talking about whether my kids are going to be Packer fans. How about whether our children are going to be raised to know Christ as their Savior? They're going to know the teachings of the Bible as confessed by the Lutheran Church, the Lutheran confessions. I, I'm not just going to ask any Christian, do they know Christ? Can they be helpful? Can they pray for the child? Absolutely. But, but I'm going to ask someone who believes what I believe, who believes what Carrie believes, so that they can help us in that endeavor because there are so many things that would tug and pull them away, not not just from Christ, but even from the Lutheran faith where there's going to just be more challenges and more struggles. Um, one other point about godparents, not required in Scripture, you don't have to have them. One of the cool things in one of the orders of service or the rites we use for the sacrament of, of baptism, ask the parents, are you going to raise this child in the teaching of the Lutheran church? Ask the godparents, are you going to raise this child um, in the teachings of the Lutheran And then what do we do? We, we put it on the whole congregation. So-and-so is just baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have an obligation, a duty, a right, a privilege, a responsibility to, to help raise this child in the Lutheran faith. And 
Will you? And yes, and I ask God to, to help me. What a great thing. What, we don't have to be sponsors to, to check in with any one of those kids after Sunday school today and ask them what the lesson was about. You, you don't have to be a godparent to check in with any of our young people once school gets started and say, hey, what's, what are you guys going through in confirmation right now? I'd be curious. Any one of your friends, your neighbors, and say, hey, I didn't, I didn't see you at church today, so I didn't see your kids either. We don't have to be sponsors to take a spiritual interest in the welfare, spiritual welfare of kids or adults. Um, maybe you've got, oh, sorry. Sponsors, just maybe that's not the best term, sponsors. Um, they don't believe for the child. It's like as long as the sponsor is a Christian, um, the, the child's going to be able to ride in on the coattails of something. That's not what we're talking about. Again, we've made that point. And number three, simply a Christian custom, but perhaps a good one. Um, witnesses. Maybe you have a family member, maybe you have a friend, and you want someone to be actively um, participating that day. Maybe you want um, to show them some recognition. Maybe you want to use that as an opportunity to talk to them further about um, what you believe as a confessional Lutheran. A witness is not the same thing as a sponsor. A witness is simply asked to observe the baptism and verify if asked that the child truly was baptized. The witness is not asked to be involved in the spiritual upbringing of the child. For this reason, the witness need not be in doctrinal fellowship with the parents. Could that witness sign the baptismal certificate? Could that witness come back and say eight years later, 48 years later, hey, was I baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Was that a valid baptism? And witness, regardless of a confession, could say, well, there was water, and there was the word, and there was you, and it was applied all at the same time. I can verify that. That's, that can be a great, great role for that witness to play. Um, who may do the baptizing? We're going to look two weeks from today. We'll look at the ministry of the keys and confession. We'll talk about Christ giving the keys, the gospel, um, the loosening key, but the gospel to his church. That includes the, the, the means of grace. That includes baptism. So any Christian can baptize because the power is not in the person. The power is in the word of God. But generally pastors do this. This is what we're called to do. When you called me, when you called Pastor Kester to come and serve as your pastor, you asked us to publicly use the keys um, in, in the name of Christ, but in your name on behalf of you, for you, with you, through you, um, to also baptize and to offer the Lord's Supper, uh, to preach and to teach. This is what we're called to do. This helps us keep good order in the church, um, hard enough to figure out who's on the altar care this month, or who's up to usher. They show up, they don't show up, uh, they're called, they're not called, they got someone, they didn't get someone. Think about that. If we had 500 different people who were going to be up on a baptism rotation, that would be kind of hard. Um, it's just good order. Everything should be done in decently and in order. And then to keep accurate records so we can get this stuff um, filed. It's on the computer. And it happens from time to time. Someone will call up and say, mm, it was probably the late 70s. My mom and dad and I were there, and I think I was... Two, but I think it was baptized there, and for whatever reason, they want to just confirm that they were baptized. What can we do? We can go into the computer, go into the, look up their name. There it is. Yeah, July 11th, 20, uh, 1978. 2078. <laughs> 1978. That's funny. To keep accurate records. Um, so far, so good, right? And so far, we'll probably even understand this and get this. Um, it's easy, maybe, to think, ah, oh, baptism. That that happened, you know, forty some years ago. That happened 12 years ago. That happened, you know, 60 some years ago. And I, I remember it and it gives me great comfort. I know the promises God made me there, the sin God washed away there, the guilt God covered there remains today. But there's also a, an active element of baptism. There's a daily remembrance of baptism. There's a daily power of baptism that enables us to do something. Let's take a look, closer look. What does this baptizing mean? Let's read this together. It means that our old Adam, with his evil deeds and desires, should be drowned by daily contrition and repentance and die. And that day by day, a new man should arise as from the dead to live in the presence of God in righteousness and purity now and forever. Where is this written? St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, We were buried with Christ through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So um, Luther is the one, obviously, writing there, and he's the one who says we need to drown that old Adam in contrition and repentance. Luther is also famously known for saying the problem is the rascal, the old Adam, can swim. 
So he's constantly trying to get his head above the water. It'd be like if I had a, a glass box, an aquarium, I guess it's called, filled with water, and I put a bobber, red and white bobber, in there, and, and I would ask Chad to just um, sink the bobber, and he would roll up his sleeve or take off his sport coat, and, and he would push the bobber down to the bottom of that aquarium. How long is that bobber going to stay down there? As long as you keep your hand on it, and you're paying attention, and you're putting effort, and you're, you're trying, but as soon as he lets go of that bobber, what's it going to do? Right? And there it is. Um, it's the same thing with our old Adam, with our sinful deeds and desires. Constantly, we're, we're, we're trying to push them all under the water. We're trying to drown them, trying to kill them. Each day they die so that a new person can arise. Let's take a, a closer look. Um, everyone, if you take out Rome, um, your passage, Romans 6, um, this is a detailed, detailed section, 2 through 11, where Paul just makes beautiful point after beautiful point, but with so many beautiful points, um, if we just read it through, we might lose everything he's, he's saying. So permit me to read it, but I, I uh, encourage you to, to follow along. By no means, he's saying, should we live in our, we're, we're saved by grace, should we just continue to, to sin so that we can experience this grace? By no means. We, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We're going to make this point, and it's not on our, our sheets for the sake of, of, of time and condensing. I took this little part of the outline out, and now I'm talking about it anyway. But baptism connects us to Jesus. Just keep that in mind. We, we talk about baptism. It washes away sin. It covers guilt. Adopted into his family. Um, spiritually alive, heir of eternal life, those are blessings, those are awesome. But just, maybe this is something in baptism we don't talk enough about. Baptism connects us to Jesus. If you've got a pen, you might want to write that down somewhere. Baptism connects us to Jesus. To three things. What does it connect us to here? What's the first thing Paul mentions? What does baptism connect us to? His death. So think about what that means. When I was baptized, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was connecting me to Jesus and to his death that he died in my place. So I can rightly say, I wasn't born, I wasn't conceived, I wasn't alive. It was 2,000 years ago. But when Christ was crucified, I was crucified. When Christ was punished, I was punished. When Christ was forsaken, I was forsaken. When Christ was abandoned, I was abandoned. When Christ bled, I bled. When Christ went through hell, I went through hell. When Christ died, I died. Baptism connects me to him and to all that and everything he did on Good Friday, the complete payment for sin. Baptism connects me to that. Let's keep going. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now we could say as much as baptism connected us to his death and we should have added his burial. When Christ suffered, we suffered. When Christ bled, we bled. When Christ died, we died. When Christ was buried, we were buried. What's the other thing? The next thing. Baptism connects us to Jesus, to his death he died in my place. It connects us to what now? His resurrection. And there's two things we got to think about when it comes to his resurrection. I'm, I'm hoping you say the one I'm thinking of first because I want to not dismiss it but not talk about it. Because Je I'll, I'll, I'll force you to say it. Because Jesus lives, we too shall live. Baptism connects us to the resurrection of Jesus. You might write that down. To the resurrection of Jesus. Because he lives, we also shall live. He's the first fruits we too shall follow. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. Is that what Paul's talking about here, though? Is that the life Paul is talking about? Eternal life? What life does baptism give me? Connected to Jesus' resurrection, what life does baptism give me? We too may live a new life. What does he mean by that? Yeah, the life of forgiveness. The life of a child of God. The life of one who no longer lives for himself, but the one who lived and died and rose for me. This is the life of sanctification. This is the law as guide. This is the gospel empowering me and my vocations, you and your vocations, to be 
what God has called us to be. To drown the old Adam. To daily let this new person arise. Um, thought it would be great one Easter to focus on that part of the resurrection of Christ. Don't do that because people want to hear about life in heaven on Easter. So anyway. Um, yeah, I preached on this text. So anyway. Yeah, um, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Remember, we were crucified with Christ. We died with Christ. Um, even the whole law was crucified with him. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him, certainly in heaven. For we know that Christ, since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Think about what the resurrection of Christ does. It brings glory to the Father. Um, he accepted the payment for sin. The plan of salvation was accomplished. Um, the world was justified. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to Christ. So if we're going back to our scorecard, baptism connects us to Jesus, to the death he died in our place, to his resurrection that gives us life, point A and point B, life in heaven but life already now. One thing that Paul didn't talk about in Romans 6 was the other thing that um, baptism connects us to in, in reference to Jesus. Do you know what that, I mentioned it before. you know what that is? To the life he lived in our place. Right? He credits us with his righteousness. That's the Galatians 3 passage. We're clothed um, with Christ. Let's take a look at our outline. Um, in baptism, we died to sin. We're buried with Christ. We're also raised with Christ to live a new life. I hope everybody gets that. Sorry. Okay, um, the meaning now, Ephesians 4. Someone want to read that? Passage 18. Go ahead, Shree. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new as to the new mind, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness. Put, we're going to talk about putting off the old, putting on the new. Um, there's some people uh, who would remember Mr. Rogers, right? in his neighborhood, and he'd come in the door with the black hinges on there, and what would he do? He'd walk down the steps, and he'd go to his closet, and he would take off his sport coat, and he would put on his cardigan, and walk over to the deacon bench, and he would take off his loafers, and he would put on his tennis, right? Take off and put on. What are we taking on? Not, not clothing of any kind, not shoes, but any kind, not any kind of attire, but daily we want to put off, take off the old self, so that daily we can put on the new self. Let's take a look at what that would mean. What are we doing? What does it mean to put off the old self? We want to get rid of those evil deeds and desires. Focus on things above. Um, set our hearts on Christ. Um, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, author, perfecter of our faith. Garbage in, garbage out, right? The more I'm exposing myself to the trash of the world, the lust of the world, the greed of the world, the hate of the world, the, the language of the world, fill in the commandment, the sin, the more of those desires I'm going to have to snuff out because the more I'm opening myself up to them. So I want to get rid of those desires by the minute that thought comes into my mind, the minute that emotion comes into my heart, I want to snuff it out, I want to put it down, i got to get my hand back on the bobber so I can get rid of the desire and then also avoid... Sinful words and action. Now, we have a sinful nature. Of course, we're sinful from when it's out of the heart that come all of those words, all of those um, deeds, the Apostle Paul would say. But if I'm, if I'm trying to put those sinful desires under the water, I'm trying to drown them with my sinful flesh, um, it's going to then help me then avoid those words, those actions. Um, and then to put on the new self, this is that desire to do God's will. That's not a desire I can come up with on my own. That's not a desire I can work up on my own. That's the desire that's only going to come out of the gospel. That's the desire that's only going to come out of the means of grace. It's a desire that's only going to come out of worship, Bible study, remembering baptism, the Lord's Supper, where the Holy Spirit is, is, is giving me that newfound, that refound joy, zeal, determination to do what's right, to find joy in the good over the bad, uh, over the bad to love my neighbor, to show love for God by loving 
my neighbor, and then actually going out and doing that to serve God by serving my, my neighbor. Um, put off the old, put on the new. I'll, I'll pause there. Just any thoughts on that, practically speaking, relevantly speaking, realistically speaking? Um, okay. Uh, key term repentance, I, I think we had it before, so I didn't include the passages here. We talk about the eight pieces of the repentance pie, not that it's just a, a bunch of boxes we want to check once a day or once a week or even three times a day, but, but really, uh, what well, was the first of Luther's 95 theses when Luther said, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in saying repent really intended that the entire life of the Christian should be one of repentance. Repentance, there's a broad definition of it. Some could just say repentance is faith. Someone, some could just say it's confession of sins and faith in Jesus. That's all true. But to, to see what all goes into that, we talk about eight pieces of the repentance pie, and it always starts with seeing and acknowledging our sin. And when we see and acknowledge our sin, there's going to be sorrow, godly sorrow called contrition. Um, we, we feel badly that we did something. We, what do we do with that contrition? What do we do with those sins? We confess them to God. We admit them. We come clean, and as we confess them, we also ask for his forgiveness in Christ. We humbly come confessing, but we confidently come asking for that forgiveness because the biggest piece of the repentance pie is that trust. It's faith, it's, it's belief, it's confidence, knowing that Jesus already paid for those sins. God already buried those sins. He already separated that. He already covered that guilt. He forgives me in Christ. And now we get into the three pieces that talk about change. I, I, wrong. Sin wrongs other people. A sin I, com I commit against God is a sin that invariably will hurt someone else, even if they didn't know. I have an obligation to go and apologize, ask them for their forgiveness, um, to correct whatever wrongs I can. I stole $20 from mom. Well, I should pay it back. Not so that God will forgive me, but because he did. Or if I can't pay it, then I'll look for ways to work it, work it off. And then the next time I need $20, I, I'm not going to go to mom's purse and pull it out of there when she's not looking. I want to avoid those sins in the future. But this is the entire life. This is the entire week. This is the entire day. This is the entire morning of the Christian life. It's to say, this is my attitude. This is my perspective. This is what it means to daily put off the old, to put on the new, to daily drown the old Adam in contrition and repentance. Um, what did God do for me? In baptism, oh, not much, really. It made me spiritually alive. Remember, we talked about all those strikes against us when we looked at original sin, the third article. We were dead in our transgressions and sin. Now we are alive in Christ. Filthy, dirty, the muck, the mud of sin. Sins, things we think and say and do. All of that is washed clean. The slate is washed clean. We're enemies. The sinful mind is hostile to God. We're on the outside looking in. And what did he do? He put his name on us. He claimed us as his own. We belong to him. He's our heavenly father. Abba, father, we pray with all sincerity and trust. Um, he adopted us into his family. He robed us in the righteousness of Jesus. I, I'll never use it again, the rose-colored glasses. That's what happens when you try and use an illustration you haven't totally thought through. But I don't want to keep using the same ones. And I know you've heard the whole blanket of snow thing, but that's probably the best one. The blanket of snow that covers our dirty, filthy, muddy, trash-filled, littered yard. God doesn't see our sin robed in the righteousness of Christ. Uh, an heir of eternal life. Remember, we're on the whole opposite game. Uh, we're on the wide road to hell just by being born into the world. Um, and what did he do? He put us on the narrow path to eternal life. And, and now, before I lived for myself, before I served myself, and in living and serving for myself, I, I hurt those um, around me. I certainly hurt my Savior. But now he empowers me to drown my old Adam in daily contrition and repentance. He empowers me to live for him. He empowers me to give him glory and honor and praise in all I think to and say empowers me to, to lead others to repentance, to lead others to Christ, to assure them of their forgiveness, to be a, a godparent of everybody, um, to take a spiritual interest in their relationship with Jesus. So he empowers me. Meaning and purpose, identity, um, all wrapped up in that fourth part of baptism. And then in short, you've maybe heard this before, but baptism is the shortest bath we've ever had. But it's the bath that's made us the cleanest. 
will ever be. So um, that's baptism today. We have a minute or two if anyone wants to talk further. Next week we'll look at the Lord's Supper. And then in two weeks, Pastor is going to take you through the keys and confession. And then our time in August will be spent on the commandments. We'll need two days for that for sure. Um, and then the Lord's Prayer, probably two days for that. And then we have a little extra time for wrap-up before, believe it or not, we get to Labor Day and Pig Rose. So any closing thoughts? Otherwise, we'll close with a prayer. All right. Holy Spirit, we thank you again. Uh, for the waters of holy baptism. Um, through that water and word, you washed us clean. Um, we're able to stand before our Heavenly Father, holy and righteous, without stain or wrinkle. Um, but now we pray that you would help us live that way in our day-to-day -day lives, um, to find joy, uh, delight, as Paul would say, in living our faith, in serving our neighbor, um, and in sharing your gospel. Help us to that end, to the praise of Jesus. Amen.